Okay, should we start? Just let people settle in. Welcome everyone, I'm Andreas from the MArch, the course leader, and I had the pleasure to co-host, co-curate, co-organize this uh, fundamental series with my colleagues. And I'm not going to say much other than welcoming you to the spatial practice uh, lecture series, which is the last one of this series. Um, and maybe some housekeeping. There is going to be uh, no scheduled fire alarm. If you hear it, it's real run. And we meet outside in the front of the building. If, uh, if we survive the talk, we congregate in the bar. And uh, I kind of invite you all to join us, because it's always a very nice way to informally continue the conversation. I'm also very pleased to have Tom Dykoff back in the building after he was ill last, uh, last session. So I'm going to hand over here to him and welcome him. And thank you all and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Um, it, it's lovely to be back. Um, I have to say thank you to Jeremy Till for being a far brainier me um, a fortnight ago when I was uh, struck down and on my sickbed um, watching reruns of Supermarket Sweep, which thoroughly restored me back to health. So here I am back again, um, and it's great to be back for this final one. Um, and it's good to start, I think we should all start today with a celebration of a bit of good news, a bit of excitement. Um, those of you that have been watching the news today will know there was a historic um, judgment in the Court of Appeal um, to stop the Heathrow third runway expansion. Um, an amazing moment, and I think we should celebrate it in some way. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, good to, it's good to have these moments of, um, of positivity amidst the gloom um, of which there is so much uh, at the moment. Um, and it's also a great example, I think, of how energy and activism correctly applied at the right point can enact change, can change ways of doing and ways of thinking. Um, that's what we're talking about this evening in the final fundamentals. Um, there has been a narrative arc to the series. We began with the building. We moved out to the city. And now we're thinking about the bigger picture, how we change our structures of thinking, our habits, um, our ways of doing things. Um, how do we change who we are? Um, how do we go against all the values, all the habits, all the learning that we've we've had since birth, that we've learned and accumulated over the decades. How do we unthink or rethink four or five hundred years of globalization and, and Western capitalism? A big ask. That's a big thing to do. And we've got to do it really, really fast. Even bigger ask, um, which of course can lead us all to uh, climate anxiety and, and worries. Um, but let's try and think of some solutions, some ways out of this ways out of thinking differently, doing things differently. Um, can we teach an old dog like me new tricks? Can we think of new ways of doing things? Can we, can we get into new habits? Um, OK, I can go vegan, and I can not build and design airports. But can I change what's going on up here in my brain? How can we do that? Um, a fortnight ago, Jeremy introduced those three key terms behind Western capitalism, prosperity, growth, and plenty, um, and railed against them. Maybe one way of moving forward is to rethink what they mean. Maybe we give them new definitions. Maybe plenty means biodiversity, plenty of nature. Maybe that's a way that we can rethink and change and reprogram how we conceptualize our relationship between humans and nature moving forward. Um, there are ways. It's difficult, but there are ways. Maybe we all need to go on a kind of planetary cognitive behavioral therapy. We need to go on the couch to try and rework our habits. Um, but then if we do that, how do we ensure the Boris Johnsons and Jeff Bezoses of the world also undergo the same changes? To talk about that this evening, we have uh, five speakers um, from a range of disciplines 
only one architect this time. Uh, we have Professor Peg Roars from the Bartlett School of Architecture. There she is, Professor of Architecture and Philosophy, um, and an expert on how architectural histories and architectural practice, how they intersect and connect with ideas, human theories of uh, ecology and nature, uh, right up to the present day, our ideas about biopolitics and ecofeminism and the Anthropocene. Um, she's also the editor of a brilliant book. Um, I recommend it all to you, a book of essays called Architectural Relational Ecologies. And she's also co-creator of an amazing film from 2016 um, called Equal by Design about the housing crisis, equality, and well-being. We have our token architect, Ian Taylor, Director of Research and Sustainability at Field and Clegg Bradley Studio, who are the Sterling Prize winning co-architects of Accordia, that amazing housing estate in Cambridge, um, and also architects of the National Trust uh, headquarters in Swindon, and since 1988, I think, the, of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, an amazing place, among many other buildings. Um, what's amazing about Field and Clegg Bradley is that they emerge in the 1970s at a time when we were also wrestling with societal chaos, um, much of it centred on environmental crises as well. Um, and they are one of the many architects that were wrestling with these questions back then, back at their birth. Um, and who have endured right up into the days, placing ecology and sustainability right at the heart of their thinking. Um, we have Professor Elizabeth Shove um, from the Sociology Department at Lancaster University, who's an expert on our everyday habits um, as members of consumer societies and how we can shift our behavior to enact wider shifts in society through everyday acts. Um, and in recent years, we've been looking in particular at our use of energy and how we can change um, our use of that. She's co-editor of Sustainable Practices, uh, Social Theory and Climate Change. Uh, fourthly, we have Dr. Dr. Zoe Svensson, um, who lectures in theatre and performance at Cambridge University and directs the performing arts company Matis, which um, I learnt today is named after the shape-shifting shape Greek goddess of cunning and wisdom, which I think we could all do with um, approaching these terrible questions. Um, Matis makes participatory theatre and installations exploring contemporary political debate, such as 2018's We Know Not what, what We May Be, which imagines a future under very different conditions to today. And she's interested in what tactics she can bring from theatre and performance to enable us to enact changes at a wider level. And finally, we have, we have Andrew Sims, co-founder of the New Weather Institute, uh, a cooperative think tank, which, as it, he puts it, designed to accelerate the rapid transition to a fair economy that thrives within planetary boundaries. Um, he's a political economist and an environmentalist and former policy director at the New Economics Foundation, where he set up its climate change, energy, and interdependency program. Um, and he's a man of relentless energy, enthusiasm, and productivity. Um, and hopefully he'll give us some insights about how we can enact some political change as well. Um, but to start us all off, we have Professor Peg Rawls. So it's either, whatever, one of Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, so thanks very much, Tom, for that wonderful, energetic, vibrant intro. Um, I did say I wasn't sure if he would really want me to go first, because I want to turn you all into zombies. So I want to talk about a political, an ecology, ecological imaginary of the non-human architect. Sometimes a zombie, sometimes of alterity, but always already an ontology, that is a way of being, a way of living, that architecture can still forget, exclude, or make extinct. As some of you know, I work from a feminist and a materialist concept of architecture and relations, and also really I work on ontologies of life, mainly, and often with conversations of care. So I want you tonight to care about zombies. Who are they? Where do they come from? Are you one? I'm one. I live with the undead. This is what the Anthropocene is asking us to reimagine. Ways of life and being who exist and have always existed, but which have reductive architectures of thought also that make them, un make them extinct and make them undead. And here are the two first 
non-humans in my talk. Merry Misses, 1971, Disappearing Earth in the Sight of Twin Towers, two years after, The Utopia of Earthrise, and Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels, who really was the non-human to Robert Smithson's uh, great Spiral Jetty and others. These are two women land artists who were also admitted from the first exhibition of land art at Cornell University in 1969. An alternative title for my talk could be Extinction Stories. Extinction Stories of Fear and Loss are mighty present today. Some are collective, some are planetary, some, but not all, one very public narrator of these really deals with the notion that extinction is only constituted by fear. And in particular, these don't recognize the difference or histories of parallelations that women and black peoples and minorities experience every day. So I'm connecting these stories of extinction and zombies through the notion of Zoe, this is the other concept of life that accords with the minor and the unidentified and the powers which come from micro and alterity um, relations. These are the biopolitics that Agamben says are about loss and fear and can only mean destruction. But feminists like Bradotti and Haraway see Zoe as alternative and affirmative, or um, affirmative ways of living, other life forces, other imaginaries, and if you've been a woman or a minority in architecture, you've always been another life force. So here's another beautiful creator of planetary ab ab absences. Oh, pardon me. And this is specifically absences or black life. Frank Bowling, the Guinean artist whose map paintings of the late 1960s were also excluded from land, formal land art, even when shown in a leading US institution not that far away from Cornell. But how does extinction and zombies fit with the question of architecture? Well, as Tom's actually said already, these link with questions of capitalism, of energy, fossil fuels, planetary life and death. And I want to suggest that I, like many people who work here, and I'm sure in the room already with these narratives, that the discipline needs new ontologies, new vocabularies and new imaginaries. And these are two people who've also done this work. Mark Fisher, Catherine Yusof, again, they're not architects, but who've already looked at how these questions of life and non-life are actually very, very intertwined in the way that we live today. But I want to emphasize here that these are very affirmative writings, even when people talk about them as very powerful narratives of death or violence or pain. Instead, these are writers who are asking us to re-engage with histories of colonialism and of difficulty, which we need in order to gain a new semblance of imaginary power. Now, these are very different from uh, the imaginary that the architectural community still holds on to. And I would suggest that the place where I come from, this is still a very strong kind of narrative. And this is one of the pieces, one of the um, Dymaxion maps um, from Buckminster Fuller. This was produced just before World War II. And it's when he developed a whole set of powerful imaginaries that many architects still live with and adore. But it's an imaginary where he was it shows how caught he was in the modernist myth of accelerated and accumulated and automated progress. And he was unable to recognize that although this map, which is an energy slave map, in fact reproduces what he sought to question and change, which was racism um, and a more informed notion of autonomy, actually resembles the notion of uh, labor inequality and slavery that are now still with us and increasingly very much likely with the way in which automation is presented by corporate and um, international uh, capitalism. But I want to say I'm not against technology automation per se. I am nevertheless very, very critical of the irresponsible kind of myths that architecture still peddles. For example, in housing, which is a conversation that's happening near me, and the impact that this has on the already non-human cultures, women and minorities particularly. Questions of critical sympathy are not just happening now, they've already happened for many decades. And these are questions of alterity and Zoe. And also they're not being done just by artists and politicians or poetics or feminists or people in the humanities. And here are three other examples. I would say, although they weren't situated feminist practitioners, the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth, published in 1972, again, just three years after this semblance of, um, of Earthrise, and others, other Earths, um, shows a similar kind of idea of um, understanding zombification. 
a book that predicted and analyzed the toxic, unsustainable reliance on fossil fuel. And then we've got a more recent one, Elizabeth Colbert's 2014 writings about the extinction of animals and biodiversity to really mobilize a political imaginary into the popular um, scientific press and, and public. And finally, contemporary work, The Human Planet, um, Mark Maslin, Simon Lewis, geographers, who are now also examining the global and the geological politics of the Anthropocene and the geological ones through a historical narrative. And I find this really interesting that geographers are now beginning to look at political narratives, even though they're a very scientific pair of writers. And finally, I want to close with a few of the affirmative li other life practices. And these will be two that I'm sure many people in this room know. Rachel Carson's 1962, Silent Spring, this beautiful mythical telling of the scientific study of damage of DDT that we are all still indebted to. A woman who is excluded and zombified by the scientific canon at the time, but whose science is truly affirmative and situated. And then, of course, Donna Haraway's Companion Species, which wittily and wonderfully shows not the zombie life, but the non-human life of living with others. And I'm going to close with two other artists, um, who, one of whom will come back again from the beginning. So I want to show you now just two more slides of another practitioner who we've worked a lot on. This is Agnes Dennis. And this is her book of dust, which captures the body, the pharmacological, the organic, toxic, climatic, and planetary agency of dust. And this goes along with her planetary projections of the Earth, which in our times, when invertebrates are the sentinels of anthropocenic uh, extinction again, her 1974 imagining of the world as a snail, an invertebrate, may also contribute to the more affirmative living with others, aliens, and alternatives. And I'll just close now with another image of Frank Bowling's more than human planetary imaginary. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. The first, I hope, of lots of positive and affirmative um, thoughts. Next up, we have Ian Taylor from Field and Clegg Bradley. is correct. Do I go forward just with the, the mouse? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm sorry if Peter Clegg sends his apologies uh, and I'm standing in for him. Um, and there's a blank slide and I might have some other slides but to start off with it is a blank sheet because we are in a situation where um, I think architecture is in a bit of a crisis or the building industry is. Uh, because society is now demanding something uh, which in some ways in the 70s, which Tom refers to, overall it, it was a minority issue and we can perhaps come back to that in discussion. Um, but we are in a situation now where more and more people are aware of the issue of uh, changing weather and climate change and uh, asking questions. So just as a pragmatic issue on what clients are asking, we are now in situations where local authorities are saying that they want something to be done. We have to do it um, by 2030, for example, net zero carbon. Clients are saying this. Um, and is the industry able to deliver? I think in the end, if we can get through this next few years, uh, perhaps we can widen the debate again in construction about a more visionary view about what architecture uh, can do other than the pragmatic issue of building things and making functional spaces. So one of the first things that we don't understand is what carbon impacts are of buildings. Over the 30 years, last 30 years, a lot of work has been done really understanding the carbon impacts of energy and heating and lighting, and we can now control those quite well but we don't think about what, what is used to make the furniture, the, the ceilings, the walls, the structures of our buildings. And the industry doesn't have the information. So how, we've, got to edu the, we've got to educate ourselves on this. So when we're building a building, uh, the first one to negative operational carbon, you may use a lot of carbon building it, but it could be carbon negative in operation. And at some point in the future, it might be carbon negative overall. The second line is that you make a building out of uh, 
a grown material, which over its life you could, could argue, and there's a debate about this, you could sequester and say that it's carbon negative to start off with. It uses energy to keep it in operation. At some point, it becomes carbon positive. The ideal is the bottom, which is we build things which are themselves carbon negative, and they operate and they generate electricity uh, and power. So another point towards this then, there's an exhibition in our office uh, just near Pooch Street at the moment where each totem here represents one kilogram of CO2 and each material inside the totem to make that sample has created one kilogram of CO2. And it's just starting to physically understand what are the impacts of our construction. And that thinking obviously makes you understand the importance on the top line of uh, keeping old buildings, because there is all the energy and pollution that they created. Can we avoid building new buildings, so make the most of what exists? In the second line, be very responsive to climate, culture, and geography, uh, and the, the regenerative potential of landscape. In the middle, modern buildings also need uh, also run out of uh, life. This building will probably need services upgrade in 10 years' time. Uh, the South Bank Centre, uh, that fantastic brutalist building, the Hayward and the Queen's Hall, we renovated over the last few years. The Hayward now uses two-thirds less electricity, but the Queen Elizabeth Hall is using exactly the same amount of power in use but it's much more comfortable and it's got much better production. But it's nowhere near zero carbon. So what do we have to do? At the bottom, just some examples of buildings. Uh, the one on the right-hand side should be net zero carbon for seven years. That's about to start on site. The one just before it is the first passive house building in, in Oxford. So we've been working out what has to be done, and this is compared to Peg's talk very mundane, but we've got to be mundane. There's a, there's a crisis. What can we do? And clients are demanding this. The government isn't, but they should be persuaded to. But uh, local authorities are, uh, user clients, businesses. And against the RIBA job stages down the left-hand side, we've got to do things, primarily so that by 2025, we believe all the buildings that we're, we've designed that are starting on site, overall, that portfolio of buildings has to be designed to operate to be net zero in order to have any chance of getting to 2030 and for anyone to be able to say they are net zero. And the things that have to be done then are uh, practical. So right now, we're, we've just designed tools and we're analyzing all our work up to planning uh, RBA stage three, to try and understand what is the carbon impact of that construction, because we don't know. We've then got to work out how much it's got to improve each year on year. Uh, we use the One Planet Living Initiative to try and look at the whole holistic range of uh, a sustainability impact so that in the end, we can live within the means of One Planet. We have always wanted to understand how well our buildings work in use, so we're developing better post-occupancy tools, contacting clients, understanding how buildings we've designed previously are performing in use. And all that's feeding into having plans so that for buildings that are starting on site, we know what the targets are and that they meet the targets. At the technical design stage, in 2022, we've got to be specifying buildings that will be net zero carbon and operating in 2030. This is two years we've got to do it. The builders have got to understand what techniques they've got to develop. All the workforce has to be educated. There's a lot to be done. And then after buildings are handed over, we've got to have a better way to inform the users how the building has been designed and how easy it can be used and through post-occupancy evaluation and monitoring, make sure it hits the targets. So in some ways, I think the 2030 target is a wake-up call for the industry, and perhaps if we don't get it together in the next three years, we will be obsolete. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ian. I love that. It's a wonderfully calm and measured plan. I like it. I want to tr transfer it to all parts of my life. Amazing. Um, thank you very much. And next we have Professor Elizabeth Show. Okay, so this is not about habits. It's not about behaviour change. I am a sociologist, and I'm going to link some of the key words together, key words about architecture, practices, and climate change, but indoors and out. So in terms of practices, I'm going to do a really brief introduction to some quite hardcore social theory on practices and just leave it there, but then I'm going to talk about indoor climates and architecture and stuff like that. So I'm starting from a really different interpretation of practice compared with architectural practice. Let's just get that out of the way. Social practice theory is a kind of version of sociology that doesn't deal with habits, doesn't deal with behaviour, doesn't deal with the individual, doesn't deal with macroeconomic structural forces. It deals with practices. It takes practices, what people do every day, not habits, though, not individual choice, but practices as shared collective phenomena that exist across time and space. That's the core. That's where you start from. And so if you do that, you take what many people find is a really strange view of people. We are just the slaves, if you like. We're the carriers of habits that exist beyond us. And I'm going to illustrate that a little bit. Um, of course, it comes close to architecture because practices also have a material element. Like the built environment is part of practices. Infrastructures are part of shaping and imagining, anticipating and enabling what people do at scale, not individually. Uh, and of course, practices shape each other, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So changing practices, just forget it. You can't, as an individual, change a practice. They exist beyond individuals. Practices are never local. They're linked across space and time. And if anybody's read any social theory, this is not at all surprising. This is kind of meat and drink. But it's very unfamiliar in other settings and very challenging in some ways. So I'm going to show you some of the challenges that when you try and work with those ideas in relation to architecture and climate change. So hands up those who know already Fanger's equation or who've ever heard of Fanger. Nobody. That's astonishing. Some of you are architects, right? OK. Well, do you, know, do you know what the normal set point is? Yeah, what is it? For a building like this, what is the set point? 18, 22, 21, exactly. Where did it come from? Fanger. 21 is not natural. 21 has a social history. 21, Fanger's equation lies behind the ASHRAE standards, which I'll show you in a minute, which are built into the building codes and standards, and the net result is things like 21. 21 or 22, that's an amazingly narrow spectrum, which is fantastically energy intensive and expensive to maintain. This is not about the clients, and it's not about efficiency, and it's not about embodied energy. It's what is the building for? Okay, so thank, that's really amazing. He, he's, he got all kind of awards um, from the air conditioning industry, not surprisingly, <laughs> and he's wearing, wearing one then. So what did he do? Well, of course, architects and engineers want to know what do people want. It's a normal question. And so this is a shot from some early thermal comfort research to answer the question, what should be the indoor climate? So this isn't actually from Fanger, it's before Fanger. Um, but they put chaps, and usually chaps, usually like looking like this, in thermal comfort chambers, and they adjust the temperature and the humidity and such like, and at some point they'll take the mask off and say, are you comfortable? And they'll do a score, one to this or that or the other, and they'll then change the other parameter. You know how it goes. It's, it's engineering uh, science, basically. <laughs> and they're after an absolute answer, not maybe 21, or, well, could it be 15? Or, you know, no, an answer. Because how else can you build buildings, right? How else can, can Field and Clegg do what they do? They ignore this, but it's central to what they, to what they do. Universal biology, there's, a, there's an assumption that humans are functionally the same all around the world. Now, there was a snag here. 
you'll spot this guy isn't wearing any clothes. <laughs> and, and they know that that's not normal. Right? <laughs> so, so Fanger had to solve that problem. And he came up with, you've heard of this, you must have heard of the clo. You have heard of the clo, that's really interesting, the clo but not Fanger. So, so what is the clo? No, it's a standard unit of thermal insulation that is worn by not naked people in buildings. Fine. But what is the clo? Could you give me an example of a clo? One clo. No. Universal, human biology, around the world, no history, no culture, no nothing. It's the man's business suit. That's one clo. You can have a half and you can have two, but one is the business suit. So, I mean, I can't go into the full range of how that comes together in architectural engineering design today, and you obviously don't know about it, even though you're architects, but you're part of it. Um, <laughs> but you do know some things about the value of central London office space and office buildings and building to the British Council Office guidelines for grade A. And you do know that you have to deliver what the client wants. And funnily enough, the client wants fang it because nobody ever talks about it. Right? It's never negotiated. So, so what is grade A? Well, you can only achieve grade A by mechanical heating and cooling. And then you can only do that if you follow the design. I mean, all the models and equations lead you to 21 or 22. So there's some very important issues going on here about the politics of space and the sector and so on, and the really long history that you don't know about Fanger and the meaning of comfort and how that gets wired in without anybody knowing or seeing or understanding how that works time and time and time Again, so this is interesting in terms of social practices, which is where I began. So what architectural practices, we've heard a lot about these sort of passive approaches and efficiency and embodied energy and so on, and more efficient technology and more insulation, but it's the tip of the iceberg because it's got nothing to do with the indoor climate. That's about ways of delivering this magic uh, stuff. Still aiming for this ridiculously... I mean, people have said they're comfortable at temperatures ranging from you know, 6, 10 to 30, and who are we to say they're not? Okay. But it's not like that now. Everyday practices have, have come, converged around 18 to 22, and when that comes to be normal, that's what people expect. And then, however much you do, you can, can't achieve that. With, I mean, you have to put in energy to achieve that, and that's not the route to a low-carbon future. Definitely not. And the funny thing is, it's got a terribly short history, we're only talking about the 70s from, from Fanger, Fanger's equation 1970. So what is going on out there? All around the world, by the way. I mean, it's not just, it's not just here. Um, and what would be the alternatives for architects? So I haven't got long, um, so I've got a quick alternative. One is to design buildings, sorry, Field and Clegg, that people are actually uncomfortable in. Because there has to be a way of breaking the hegemony and the fixedness of 18 to 22. That is a recipe for global disaster. So, so how to, how to act actively go on? So first of all, you have to make a building that's really uncomfortable if people are wearing one clothes. So having a building that's comfortable if you're wearing less or more increases the range, reduces the energy demand, takes the pressure away from the building itself. Now, funnily enough, as I say, it's a quick history. So in the 70s, not that long ago, um, in average indoor temperatures were six degrees less than they are today. You could say people were uncomfortable. Maybe they were. Well, they were wearing different clothes as well. So perhaps they weren't. So, and if you go a little bit further, like to medieval France, they really wore different clothes. So I ran this demand centre, which is about energy, and we made a modern medieval outfit, which one of my colleagues is modelling here. <laughs> and if you wore that, the 70s, well, you, would, you, know, you would easily be in the 70s and perhaps in medieval France quite comfortably. Now, can you imagine talking to architects and proposing this? Wear the insulation, don't leave it in the walls. It's very, very much more effective. And I'd be really keen to see what your response is to that, because architects are part of the problem. Right? They're making practices that are unsustainable. They're not meeting what people need. They're actively part of making it. 
So my recommendation is to think, to learn about the history of comfort, that's clearly a job for all of you, and think about the future of it too. So it's not about personal preference, it's not about technology, it's about the intersection of the practices that I started with, including those of, of the hardcore financing of the London office buildings and hardcore engineering and modelling and how, how all this works together. So if you, 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 I didn't bring the gown, I could have done, but I didn't. Um, but if you want to read more about stuff like that, there's plenty to go for. Right. <laughs> Amazing, that is what's so good about this series of fundamentals. We're all learning. I shall never forget Fanger. No, I shall never forget Fanger at all. And his extraordinary outfit, which you didn't explain. Why was he wearing that outfit? Oh, well, wow, that is some, that is some, I mean, you're in a fashion, a place famous for its fashion. I think that uh, image of uh, Mr. Fanger should be out there in, in the street to inspire our students. Um, thank you very much for that. And then um, fourthly, we have Dr. Zoe Svensson, who's going to take us through from the perspective of theatre and performance. So, um, hello, my, my position or publication is this, um, that play has become a kind of precondition of survival. Um, and those, the words play and the word survival seem somewhat at odds uh, with each other. By play, I mean open-ended, uncommitted, um, free in the sense of un uncertain. Um, uh, playful in all of its different senses of the world. Uh, and the work that I'm going to talk about, so I was asked to talk about um, what could be called my theatre practice um, in, 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 this, in this few minutes. Um, and part of the reason I think play is so important is, is to do with... Uh, which way do I need to point this? This? That. It's to do with story. Um, the question around who gets to tell the stories, how they're told, what forms they're told in, um, and what the work I've been doing is trying to think about how we imagine otherwise, how we imagine uh, what it would be like to be in the worlds which are being cu currently being invented by um, visionary architects, but also geographers and eco alternative economists, like all the different brilliant, ingenious ideas about how we get ourselves out of this mess. There's an incredible uh, degree to which there are a lot of maps, but it's very hard to imagine how you'd get from A to B. It's, a it's very hard to imagine who you would be under those conditions. Um, and so when I found this quote from Ophelia in Hamlet, when she's mad, <laughs> 500 years ago, um, I thought it sort of struck a chord with me because we were right in the middle of uh, making a piece for the um, Barbican. Um, which we ended up calling we know not what we may be after this, because I, felt, I feel that we know what we are. We might not like it, but we know how to get from A to B in the current um, in environment, but we do not know who we may be under these alternative potential conditions. Um, and the kinds of conditions I'm talking about are all things that all exist somewhere in the world in some way, in some place, in some small-scale form. But I'm wondering, what if the whole system had been transformed? Then it becomes much harder to work out how we might operate within that environment. So to that end, uh, we attempted to try and work something out. So we did a five-day performance installation at the um, Barbican. Andrew took part in it, um, which modelled and tried to imagine uh, first of all, which kinds of economic and environmental scenarios people would be interested in thinking about and then how, what it might be like to live in them. So I'm just going to... Welcome. This is your briefing. The world is warming. We are here to work out what is to be done. The scenarios you are about to explore in the factory of the future are based on conversations with our speakers and other specialists. All imagine change to the fundamental structure of society altering our social, economic and environmental relationships. We invite you to add your voice to those scenarios. 
So one of the things that we were trying to do in that piece was not only through the content of the ideas that were expressed, but also through the form, because we had a um, series of different audience groups of audience come in across five days uh, in sort of uh, what we called different generations, was imagining what it might be like to work within a structure that was larger than yourself, so that you were working on the basis of ideas and thoughts that people have been uh, already imagining, and then you were contributing to that, and then it would carry on after you, after you left. Um, and so the final part of that piece started to try and think through a variety of different formats um, about how what it would be actually like to live in these environments. Um, and that then we took forward in a commission for the Oslo Architecture Triennale last autumn, where we sort of refined that down and working with actors from London and actors in Oslo imagined a post-finance London and a post-oil um, Oslo and tried to drill down into what stories of everyday life might emerge from that. Um, and to do that, uh, oh, actually, I'll just show you this first. Oh, sorry. Oh, han ser ikke nær fra Oslo til Hagen. The recipe, the recipe goes up on mine, and she had had such a good laugh. Distribution for Tangen, so it's going to the whole world. So rather than offering a singular narrative that somehow seemed to like propose a single utopia, instead we invited lots of people to respond in very different ways. And so the actors picked up on all the different um, ideas that were emerging and then uh, imagined their way through that uh, in, from the perspective of lots and lots of different characters. And also we very deliberately didn't produce lots of images with the idea that actually when, when you tell a story, you produce an image you have, in order to hear the story, you have to produce an image in your own mind, and then that becomes yours in some way, as opposed to someone else's vision that is more likely to produce a kind of scenario of critique and uh, a, a, a non-inhabitation. So the question of like who owns the future has been a big, a big one for us in this, um, in the project. And so to make the sort of visions, we worked with about forty architects in a series of different workshops and it was really it was it was really interesting this is where the sort of question around play comes back in i think um which is that we asked them to kind of leave behind all of their everyday professional architectural practices and come and play with us about this alternative oslo and the end of all the sessions they were like oh you know what uh, i think that i think architects shouldn't build anything anymore um, and the, and the th but the thing by then was that they weren't, there wasn't a question of staring into a void of what should architecture be instead, because over that course they'd already reinvented what for them architecture would be. And so there wasn't a sense of loss or this is uh, what we're doing isn't working. It was very much more, oh, actually our job is to think about stories of the city, stories of how people live, how they're going to operate, how we repurpose things, where things go. And they were incredibly inventive on, that, on those levels. So they'd sort of already produced themselves a new job by the time they decided that the old job wasn't, um, was, no longer, was no longer viable. And I suppose that's what I mean when I, when I think about play as being a kind of precondition of survival. Because if you're very instrumental in your thinking, then you can only think within the tram lines that you're already have been operating within previously. We open up that space, something else starts to happen. Um, nevertheless, I continuously get told to get real, um, to which my answer is always, yeah, get real, which is, as in, if you're thinking in terms of the, the frame of uh, climate crisis, that means something very different. Um, but the context in which that I hear that is more to do with the sort of capitalist realist. There's no alternative. Um, there's no way out. You're being a utopian. You're naive for even imagining we might be able to do things differently. Oh, and no one will ever let us anyway. Um, so there's a kind of right-wing version of it, and there's a left-wing version of it. Um, I think at the very least we need to bear witness to the fact it could be otherwise. And so the act of imagining is one of saying we don't have to be this way. Um, and it takes on a kind of political character. But I also think with the brilliant feminist performance artist Lois Weaver, that you know, I'm sure you will know this very famous, um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, that kind of phrase that gets bandied about. What I love about what she says is if you can dream up the end of the world, then you can dream up the end of the end of the world. And I think that's the business of play, and that is also the business of survival. 
so our jobs now to imagine ourselves are out of high carbon culture, which is, as has sort of been previously kind of uh, referred to, to my mind, the intersection between this sort of extractive, um, transactive finance capitalism that we're in and its colonial histories um, and our embeddedness in, in that as a cultural level as well as a sort of technocratic level. Um, and with this, I want to uh, um, reference Christiana Figueres, who got almost all the countries in the world to say, sign the same document in the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, where she says, impossible is not a fact, it's an attitude. Um, and it comes back to me, uh, for me, to dramaturgy, to my practice, drama, um, which is the question, what kind of, who are we? What kind of character are we? Are we tragic heroes? Are we gonna cling to our economic individualism and take, go down in flames and take the planet with us? Or are we at, on some kind of epic journey? Do we need to change the structures of our imaginations and our, and our operations? Are we in, inside a, something that's bigger than ourselves that has a history and it has a future and we can't be in complete control of it? Um, and so the question for me is really, do we, you know, do we, do we burn up or do we brave it out? Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, two key takeaways so far. Um, don't build architects. Don't build. Um, if you are going to build, build uncomfortable buildings. I love that. I love that. I'm going to take that forward. Um, and finally, to round us off, uh, we have Andrew Sims. Um, hello, they always say uh, ne um, never apologise and never explain. I'm going to start with um, two apologies. My first apology is um, I don't have any pictures to show you, so I'm afraid you only get me to look at. I was rather hoping we could leave that giant word epic up there. That would be quite a nice thing to stand in front of. Um, <laughs> well, how about that? Ask and it shall be done. And the, the, other, the other apology I wanted to make was... Um, was, was for my, 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 my grotesque cultural insensitivity in, in, in coming here this evening, is that I quite inadvertently dressed like an architect from the 1990s. <laughs> and it's a complete accident, and I'm sorry if it's upsetting anybody. Um, 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 Tom gave a, a kind of a couple of lines about some of the things that I do. I wanted to mention two others. One of our main projects at the moment is a thing called the Rapid Transition Alliance. And you can find it online, rapidtransition.org. And it's all about evidence-based hope. And rather than theories of change, it's about practices of change and sort of lived examples which, which demonstrate it. And the other one is, I kind of forgot until I sort of set out here, um, I'm also involved with a group called Scientists for Global Responsibility, which has an architect's wing. So if there's any radical architects in the room and you're looking for a home to go and practice responsibility, sign up afterwards. You'd be very, very welcome. Now, what I should say is, I do like architects. I have a particular reason for liking architects because um, I was introduced by an architect to one of my favorite creatures in the world, which is the Namibian fog basking beetle. Now, um, the reason I like it is that it was um, brought to my attention by my favorite architect, a man called Michael Paulin, who wrote a book about biomimicry in architecture. And um, it demonstrated a way in which you could find ways to grow food in the desert, because what the Namibian fog basking beetle does, um, it lives near the coastline, and at night it climbs up to the top of a sand dune, sticks out its wings, waits for the condensation to settle, and then just at dawn, before the sun comes up, it tips it up and pours the water into itself, thus surviving in the desert. So thank you, architecture, for introducing me to the Namibian fog basking beetle. Um, when you work in the area of sustainability and sustainable behavior change, one of the phrases which you come across a lot is um, the phrase choice architecture. And um, Tom mentioned the announcement about Heathrow today. And I just wondered, I don't know if there's any, how many practicing architects there are in the room. I just wondered if anybody was lined up for a job on Heathrow third runway. Just really sorry, really sorry. Um, and uh, Elizabeth was talking about, about practices, because if you'd listened to the Today program yesterday morning, you'd have heard the chief executive of um, Heathrow Airport talking as if climate change did not exist. I'd have to say that the interviewers from BBC Radio 4 also completely failed to ask the question, even though we knew that the legal ruling was due. And um, because, of course, the line that the management of Heathrow Airport take 
is that it is impossible to li even conceive of living without aviation expanding. Now, um, I want to say that we know from past experience, and it's one of the examples we've written up on the rapid transition site, that this is not the case. And I know this is not the case because back in 2010, I live in South London and I live under kind of um, a flight path. And one morning I woke up and something was different and I couldn't, to begin with, put my finger on what it was. And then I realized that it was silent. And it was silent because far away, up north, several thousand miles away, um, a volcano had exploded in Iceland called something like <laughs> um, and uh, it kind of flicked a switch in the aviation industry to off. So all over Northern Europe, planes were grounded. Every, every, everything stopped. Now, if you believed the lines from the aviation industry, it, the, the sky would literally have fallen on our heads. But actually what happened over the four days that there were no flights was really instructive because people found, found workarounds. People who were traveling turned to social media. They sort of sofa surfed and they car shared. Other transport networks put on different, uh, put on additional capacity. Supermarkets that were importing things like luxury horticultural goods from um, Asia and, and, and Africa turned to local suppliers. People, uh, business people who are expecting to fly to meetings turned to video conferencing. Um, and life just kind of went on. So if you try to find examples where you can invite people to imagine fundamental shifts in choice architecture and in practices, um, look for them and see what you can learn from them. Because what we know, as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have told us, is that all aspects of life require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes. And we're finding increasingly that we have the mandates for that. Globally, there is now um, over 1,400 juri 1, jurisdictions that have declared a climate emergency with various dates for getting to zero carbon. Uh, it's quite a few around 2013, 2035, which is really, really soon. 80% um, of people in Britain now live in a local authority area where a climate emergency has been declared. But the problem is there are not the plans to deliver on those promises. And that's where you lot come in. Um, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to just mention a couple of little examples which kind of speak to the built environment. And we now we know from the official advisor to the government, Climate Change Committee UK, <coughs> that the UK's 29 million homes at the moment are uniquely, or maybe not uniquely, that's part of the problem, um, generally completely ill set for a warming world. They're not prepared for the increasing weather extremes and they're not prepared from the point of view of decarbonisation. In fact, if anything, emissions have been increasing both in the construction sector and emissions from UK households also went up at least between 2016 and 2017. Um, we're knocking out about um, 200,000 new homes a year, which means that the vast majority of buildings we will have in 2050 will be the buildings that we already have. So the challenge is a massive challenge of retrofit, not just about getting new builds down to, you know, uh, you know, either zero or, 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 or negative carbon. Now, there was some, the government came out with some new standards um, just a few weeks ago. Um, the Climate Change Committee came back and looking at those in the context of what they said the previous year, they've said that this is still not good enough. It's not remotely getting close to where we need to get to. So I'm going to kind of finish off my um, comments in, 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 a, in a couple of minutes with, with a challenge, with a challenge to the profession, um, because the title for this evening is Can We Save Architecture from Obsolescence? So I'm going to give you a challenge, and if you can answer that positively, you will save yourself from obsolescence. Um, but I wanted to give you a couple of examples of things which, you know, kind of drift from memory, things that we forget that we were capable of doing. Um, we just um, put a story of change up on the Rapid Transition website today about uh, a now only kind of half-remembered incidents when uh, 14 million homes and 40 million appliances were co had their fuel source changed not that long ago and in less than a decade between 1968 and 1976. And that was after the discovery of North Sea um, oil and gas, when homes were switched from town gas to natural gas. And because town gas was generally manufactured from coal and oil, it saw a really radical cut in um, the energy intensity, the carbon intensity of energy 
supplies. And that happened, interestingly, at the time when the prevailing ideas were still different then. It was a very centrally coordinated effort that sought the alignment of manufacturers, of households, of public information campaigns to deliver that. And you can look at, you look at house building itself. We're living in the middle of a housing crisis, which is a very, very complicated thing. But it's easy to forget that it wasn't that long ago that social housing was being built at a rate which today seems unimaginable. In 2018, local authorities um, put up 2,600 social homes. In the 1950s, when Britain was much more indebted and messed up economically even than it is now, local authorities were building over 250,000 homes a year under a Labour government. In the 60s, over 200 Housing homes, so that was under a Conservative government. In the, in the, in the, in the mid-60s, under, uh, under a Labour government, um, around 200,000 homes. We've somehow lost the imagination to believe that we can deliver things at speed and scale. Now, we know from a lot of very detailed modelling by the likes of people like Mark um, Jacobson at Stanford University that there are pathways to achieve 100% renewable energy well, not only in every state of the US, but in at least 139 countries around the world by 2050. The pathways are known. Um, there's some interesting examples where people have wrestled with delivery um, in, uh, in particular localities. There's a very good case study of a warm homes initiative in Kirklees, where they were able to uh, retrofit 51,000 homes in a three-year program. Um, and there was a study by Delft that shows that we could retrofit 11 million homes by, um, by 2030. It's really important that we believe in the possibility of change. Now, no past example is going to be a perfect analogy for what we need to do today. But I believe if we look at those moments when we have mobilized and delivered transitions at speed and scale, they can remind us of our agency and our ability to achieve change. And we can learn lessons from things that didn't go right. But the moment you start believing it, there's a, no time to go into it now, but in terms of sustainable behaviors, there's a fascinating and deep literature about how behavior changes are achieved, notwithstanding what Elizabeth said about practices over which you have no access. But in terms of changing choice architectures, you can look into the public health literature to find out how some radical changes have been achieved in dietary behavior, in smoking behavior, and in drink driving, and indeed through responding to massive health problems like the HIV AIDS crisis. Now, very often, those were really complex solutions which involved changes in the choice architecture, as well as much more supportive and individualized programs. Um, so I'm going to round up with your challenge, the challenge I want to leave you with um, this evening. There's, a, there's, there's an old saying, there's an old saying um, which um, I've uh, uh, best been able to source from um, Saudi Arabia, um, which, goes, uh, which speaks to our addiction to fossil fuels. And it goes like this. Uh, my father rode a camel. I drive a car. Actually, I don't. I don't have a driving license. I drive a car. My son flies a jet plane. His son will ride a camel. So if I were to shift that and think about how it might work in my own situation, I suppose I would say something like, you know, my mother breathed the pollution from a coal-fired power station. I inhale car exhaust. So does my daughter. Her daughter will live in a car-free city powered by community renewable energy and live in a carbon negative home. So my challenge to the profession to save it from obsolescence is we've got about 29, 30 million buildings in the UK. Um, and as one of the proposals that we made in the Green New Deal, which we first published back in 2008, it's taken a while for it to become a popular policy vehicle of choice, but in its most recent iteration introduced to Parliament, we introduced the challenge of retrofitting every building in the country by 2030. And I'd like you to work out how we're going to do it. And if you can do that, I think we can truly say that architecture is saved from obsolescence. Thank you for listening.
Whew, that's a challenge. That is a challenge. If I could invite all the panelists up onto the stage, we'll um, have a discussion, which will open up to the audience for questions. Um, come and take a pew. Like musical chairs. So my first question, my first question is really, I suppose, to Elizabeth and Andrew. Um, I'm fascinated by the, as you say, hardcore social theory, Elizabeth, that um, I certainly wish to be educated in. But certainly, it's that question of how do we enact change in behaviour? Is it even possible? Andrew suggests a very kind of positive vision that we are, we can by changing that wonderful phrase choice architecture. Um, Elizabeth, can we, but you, you presented a, a scenario where our, our practices are so deeply embedded, deeply out of our control, that we are unable to change them. Is that, is that correct or yeah. am I? No, I mean, you need to think, who is we? That's the first question. There is no answer to that. You need to recognise that what's called individual behaviour is very actually bedded in existing building stock, in existing infrastructures and so on. Of course they change. I mean, the biggest public health transformation was the sewage system. You know, big events like that are definitely, definitely relevant. But you can't sort of put your finger... I mean, I think, I mean I've written very nasty things about behaviour change, as you can, as you can kind of imagine. Um, because that place is an individual choice. Uh, I mean, choice architecture is a funny language because it's actually slightly moving away from individual choice, so it's interesting like that. Um, but individual choice is definitely not where it lies mm. in that, that way because yeah. it's, it's just misleading. So what in that, in that situation, going down to the ordinary habits of, say, an architect, and the, the audience is full of student architects, yep. in terms of changing their practice, what are they able to do? So skip the habits, but the practice is interesting. I mean, what is architecture in a way? So actually, why are you not contemplating those issues of comfort? Why is that background? If that's not your choice, that's, that's not even part of your training. That's the way the job is structured. But architecture has a history and some kind of future, I suppose. And in a way, <laughs> you're kind of, um, you know, like, like Todd and Ted, do they negotiate about the indoor climate? When and where and how, you know, so that, that would be the kind of way to go. Fangus equations, I mean, I think the standards, I think the assumptions buried in modelling, these need to be brought out into the open. So there's a, a huge degree of education and communication that needs to go on? No. No? Not really. <laughs> I mean, that again assumes a kind of individual persuasion type logic. If you think about how Fangus equation took hold, it wasn't through education and persuasion. No. There were all kind of other institutional issues at stake there. So, so that's where it lies. It doesn't mean that there's no agency, but you have to understand, you have to understand how limited that is. Mm. There's an illusion of choice, which is deeply dangerous. So in that uh, idea of um, how you enact or how one can... One, you, yeah, come on, be specific. Okay, me. <laughs> you, you can't do anything. Can't do anything. No. <laughs> Probably. Andrew, do you have an alternative opinion? Uh, well, I'll make, a I'll make a complimentary point, um, I, I, I think, um, because I agree with um, a lot of what um, Elizabeth says. I'd say that we can't underestimate the power of social norms, but of course, where do social norms come from? Social norms come from lots of embedded practices. They come from um, cultural uh, legitimation in various ways. And I find the area of advertising really interesting. Once, as a kind of a, a, um, um, an exercise, I counted all the adverts that I was um, exposed to, which defined me first and foremost as a, as a consumer, as someone who kind of actualizes and realizes their, their worth in life through buying stuff. And I compared that with the number of um, uh, signs or messages I saw in the public domain, which spoke to me as a citizen with extended responsibilities. Um, at the end of the day, I'd, come, I'd seen well over 500 adverts, and I'd seen sort of three messages which addressed me in a different way. And, and one of them was a sign at my um, local uh, train station that asked me to please uh, not abuse their staff. 
another one was a kind of a police sign by the side of the road um, um, saying, uh, um, it, you know, motorists, please don't knock cyclists um, over. And another one was a, was a, was a crime scene set of identification. So I'm kind of being um, identified and, and specified in, in, in such a way to be a certain kind of person. Now, we know that from a lot of other studies that this has massive effects on how people... Um, relate to other people in the world like the studies that show children exposed to advertising are less good at forming relationships with um, children of their own age as well it affects their sense of well-being their, their sense of self-worth so if you live in a cultural paint pot which supports a certain kind of social norm which in turn supports supports a certain kind of consumption behavior. It's very difficult to re-engineer those, those sorts of things. But what the other thing that we do know is that social norms do shift over time. Whether it's attitudes towards drink, drink driving, whether it's attitudes towards um, sexism and, and sort of me, me too um, re revolution, whether it's um, things around smoking, that these things shift and they, they shift as a result of both um, you know, structural and cultural interventions. So, and, and I've got a funny feeling, I don't know whether this is not, the research there to stand it up. But with the sort of acceleration and amplification of various of the communication technologies, the speed with which you can um, make something an issue and problematize it, um, I, I have a sense that it may be getting quicker. I don't know. But the speed with which the popularity of, you know, when I grew up, being a vegan was that, you know, if you're a vegan, you're kind of a butt of every single joke. And when Greg's landed their vegan sausage roll, um, they were completely unprepared for its um, success and popularity and ran out of stocks for about two, two weeks. And now you've got all this kind of me too -ism. Now I don't want to kind of, um, uh, where all the other fast food sort of people falling over themselves to kind of produce something similar. So the shift towards a kind of a plant-based diet, which has a really meaningful impact on carbon emissions. There's something which is potentially happening quite quickly there. Um, I don't, wouldn't want to overplay it, but social norms do shift. Um, and finding the levers to help them shift as fast as possible, which means addressing you know, the built environment, the cultural environment, the way in which things become social norms are all part of doing that. Peg and Zoe, you both spoke you know, very interestingly about <coughs> the affirmative or the hope or possibility. How, is it, how important is it, is it to change the stories that we are being told? at a societal level, but also in a place like St. St. Martin's, a school where we're teaching. How important is it to present them with new, these new imaginaries? Well, I think stories are everything. Um, you know, we, we understand how the Sorry, 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 I thought you were pointing at me. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, um, I, well, I want to kind of connect actually back to um, Elizabeth's really firm kind of, um, you know, um, admonition about the idea of a kind of concept. I, mean, I don't think you are suggesting a concept hope, but what I suppose I want to sort of insert, and I'm, as a question to you maybe, is that you seem, you're, you're obviously critiquing this notion of a kind of local kind of romantic concept of social power and freedom, which I totally understand. There is a, and that obviously is actually quite controversial because there are many individuals, often very young, but across all age groups here at the moment are finding huge kinds of sort of notions of local democracy or of kind of collective behavior or collective change, which they feel very empowered mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. And it is really interesting because it is really intergenerational, I think. There's, you know, I do think old women in the public sphere are actually very present now in a way that they might not have been a long time ago, or certainly in the last sort of 10 years, if you like. But I do think there is a really big issue about still within those sort of political, um, if you like, the political left, um, anxiety and um, uh, scepticism about scientific practice and science, techno-scientific methods. Mm. And I do think feminist kind of parts of that do really buy into it. So I do, I guess one of the reasons why I sort of, and I do still think she's really important, even though there have been many more sort of recent thinkers, but her way was really interesting because mm. she was talking about situative science. She was not saying you can't have these large-scale concepts of transformation. Mm. Mm. She's not talking about this notion of a sort of romantic, no. autonomous, mm. avant-garde self, which is the nightmare of the architectural profession, <laughs> because it is basically white and an old man. And actually, it's, I, wanted, I wanted to make a point in a minute about um, naked universal truth. 
on a chair because that's actually Banham. So, I mean, it is great that you pointed out that I'm not an architect, but I didn't have the history of, what's the guy called? Banger. Banger, who is the alternative of Grace and Perry's amazing UK. <laughs> um, but there's the Banham. So, Rainer yeah, Banham, yeah. British architectural historian, he uses that in his most, it's one of his celebrated texts, The Home, home is Not Enough. Mm. House of a Home. And I mean, that obviously is part of that cybernetic. So cybernetic concepts are used really positively and extensively and are still very powerful in the, um, in the profession for many different uses, sometimes apparently quite ethically. I'm not quite so sure because it's too universal for me and it's white blokes who are sometimes addressed. Um, but anyway, the thing I wanted to say is I do think there's this sort of, you're, you seem to be suggesting that there's a kind of concept of a sort of removal from a sort of notion of large-scale thinking practices that you're arguing that this social practice from your expertise does in some ways deal with these sort of concepts of a sort of a romantic agency that can in the end only stay very much local and I do think that's the problem actually that lots of people who work on notions of affirmative and political change are dealing with I, it seems to me that's probably the conversation that links all of this so I wanted to sort of maybe raise more about this notion of the sort of questions of science and politics, political science. Scientists who do evidence-based research but are also damn political. Mm. Well, and, and what to embed <coughs> that more, to get it communicated yeah. more, to get and it... And I do think, I think the arts need to start engaging with science in, in a more um, constructive, even more critical, but I think we are, I mean, Morgan's just my generation. I was trained in a fantastic Marxist <laughs> critique of science and it's very powerful up to a certain point, but I think it can be very disabling. And I think it can still be very disabling for a lot of feminist questions. In which case, in terms of how we unlearn or relearn, are we unlearning what we have learned? I mean, I too was schooled by, um, you know, white male Marxists. Um, yeah, mine were, mine were feminist female, <laughs> you know, feminist <laughs> ones as well. But, um, um, is, it a, is it a process <laughs> of unlearning that? And in which case... No, I don't know. I actually think there's amazing power in that, but I think it can be augmented. I think it can... It can I mean, this is the kind of um, Haraway element. It isn't about... Disman it's about demystification. And I think, again, Elizabeth, you seem to be suggesting there's a real problem of not demystifying some of these kinds of... Um, not all imaginaries are good. Imaginaries mm. can hide and conceal and can be very, very uh, damaging um, and exclusionary. But I... Yes, yeah, so I don't think it is necessarily about unlearning in such a sort of positive way. It's more reconfiguring. Mm, reconfiguring. I mean, so how did your process of reconfiguring those architects in Italy, how did that actually happen? Tick, what was the process? Well, um, so I was just thinking about what we try to do is think away from this consumer mentality because that I call it preference culture. Where everything's a prefer everything's a preference, and there's also a sort of thing in in the in our we experienced in the in the um, Barbican installation. That people would say, "Oh, but how could I decide on behalf of someone else what the system should be? That's really oppressive." And you get to the point where everyone's just got their own point of view, and 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 then it's like even politics becomes like they sort of pick it up off the supermarket shelf. I'll have that ketchup instead of that one forgetting maybe we need to change what's on the shelf in the first place or you know not even think about it as as that and um and so with the with the working with the architects we gave them a scenario so we didn't give them the option to decide having learned from doing the barbican installation <laughs> we didn't give them the option to decide what what some of the key elements of the world they found themselves in such that because we we talk about future scenarios but we really mean a reconfiguration of the ingredients of the present because nothing that we ever try and imagine isn't already somehow there or already but the future bit allows you to sort of jump because we're not the work isn't really interested in how do we get from a to b it's it's about fleshing out b because all the work of trying to get there spends a lot of time going oh we're at a and we, we like the idea of B, but actually, oh, it's not possible. So we never even really think about what it is or whether we, we whether, and I say, when I say we, I always mean like we in what I call high carbon culture, who are embedded in, and, and fossil fuel dependent on, you know, whether we like it or not. Because it seems to me that it sort of unites a kind of, that's a kind of global elite, elite because the Western world doesn't quite cut it anymore for thinking about those dependencies. But also when people start to talk about the, 
they talk about oh how you know how are people in rural areas in uh, in in England going to manage without their without their petrol? Aren't you you know you get this sort of social justice antagonism? Oh you like and it is very kind of identity politics orientated like oh you're middle class you you can do without your car in your metropolitan environment but what about these people and you kind of go well, what's the relationship between justice in the global south like what is someone's right to petrol versus someone's right to lunch and that and though the question of what scale you do is that so those those resistances keep kind of circling back in so one way of avoiding the kind of the question of even where you start is just to go, let's jump into a fiction because it, it creates, it's like a, as soon as you're doing a simulation and you go just the what if, you kind of move, you move the debate away from whether that particular what if, like then it doesn't matter which particular bit, like what the scenario is in that instance. And in the process of fleshing out those things transform anyway because people find different ways of imagining and telling <laughs> stories. And I think that was something like, the, so it's the implausibility that allows then a sort of serious working back to something that might be more plausible, the very act of not being, uh, not having to then deliver a design at the end of it that's gonna somehow into a commas work. Uh, and then often people then discover that lots of things they were thinking of as implausible at the start turn out to be either someone's doing it somewhere already or, or actually it's much more plausible than you would think. So it's something about taking serious steps away from worrying about what matters and using so. fiction as a device to enable that to happen to yeah. help us get it out of that way of thinking that quote yeah. that you brought up about it's harder to think about the end of capitalism and I, and I wonder if it's a, related to renorming a little bit as well because in the cold war they they did these huge you probably know about this, these huge like countrywide um rehearsals for nuclear war in which about fifteen thousand people went into about 1500 bunks across the country and pretended that nuclear war was happening for 24 hours at a time and, um, and it was about rehearsing the administration of a post-apocalyptic Britain. So it wasn't about who got saved and who was the best person to be in there. It was all about like the teleprinter operators and the, 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 like how you'd actually administrate this kind of bunker, bunker scenario. But the thing that was key about it was that, um, that was that it kind of the rehearsal didn't really, what didn't matter was whether or not anyone really thought it was going to work. It was the rehearsal itself that was at stake. But CND had a really interesting critique of it, which was that even to rehearse made nuclear war more likely because it, re it normed in the ideas of the population that this was something that was possible. And I've really sort of taken that and flipped it around and go, well, if we rehearsed for these other ways of being, perhaps there's a way of somehow at some level shifting the norm, shifting the, what feels like a norm, even though you're only doing it in a fictional sphere once it's countenance and then you see it you kind of go oh look they're doing it in that way that we imagined last week I mean we literally had that in Oslo where some we'd written seaweed farm on the map of the harbour and this guy took us out on a boat two days later went so I'm thinking I'm next year I'm going to start a seaweed farm over here <laughs> well, we just made that up and it was a really yeah so then you kind of suddenly start just your lens changes mm -hmm. Ian you, you talked about the but you um brought up the the idea of what you were talking about was mundane, but that mm. the mundaneness is presumably crucially important. Mm. And particularly as somebody that has worked as a practicing architect since the 1970s, probably the last time when um, our interest in ecology and the environment was perhaps at a, a, a similar scale mm. to, to, it, to what it is today. Can you talk about how you have embedded in your own practice, in your own work, in your own ways of working, your own ways of thinking, what that journey has been like from the 1970s. I was yeah, well, I was, I was in at school in, in about the 70s, two minutes, so I, was, I wasn't quite an architect then. Right. Um, but uh, it is interesting to reflect on the fact that the at the time when uh, Peter Clegg and Richard Pilgrim set up the practice, which was a few years before I left university, um, there was the oil crisis, which you mentioned. Um, and so Peter went to Yale, I think, and he wrote a whole book on how to get use energy from the sun. Um, and it wasn't mainstream. And I think it's, uh, I thought Elizabeth's uh, introduction of, of the man who in, invented the set point, whose name I didn't know, but I know all about for 21 yeah, yeah. degrees, uh, is very instructive in that uh, this, and actually is very representative of the um, oil economy. Because basically, there was there was a view up, up until the oil crisis of the seventies that 
energy was limitless. You, know, you can do anything. And the international style and the idea that technology solves, solves anything, which we can export all the way around the world, or the, the American economy if we could, um, sort of was seen as, a, as, a, as the promised land by many people. Um, and at that, at that time, there was much, there were fantastically strong, and there still are, very strong vernacular architectures in different places all the way around the world. There were in England. Okay. And vernacular um, is where we've sort of got to go again. And, and in terms of your theory, your practice, you know, we've, we're coming to the absolute end, I think, of the, a practice of believing that everything should be the same everywhere no matter what culture, sex, whatever, religion. We all want 21 degrees and uh, everything is designed like that. And uh, that's institutionalized and is in legislation, it's in professional guidance by institutions. Um, it's not only the set points of the 21 degrees, but the floor loadings that we have to build to. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of health and safety, but you know, all these legislative things add layers of, of bureaucracy and avoidance of risk. So everything now is over-designed in so many ways. Um, and I think our practice has always had the feel that things should be specific to the place. So the design should respond to what the people are wanting of the building and the ecology and the landscape of the place. And that is the issue. And 20 years ago, we were having debates with uh, users, office users, about 21 degrees and saying, look, the way to get this building to use less energy and passively is to wear different clothes at different times of the year, have a bigger temperature range, and have that built into the brief. And 20 years ago, clients were doing that. They still wanted the air conditioning there in case it might not work sometimes. Um, and I think in the last 15 years, we've really gone backwards from where we were around 2000, the late 90s. Um, so now I think, as I said, we're in a position where people are realizing that something's got to shift. Um, I'd really recommend a book, which you're probably all aware of, called Drawdown, uh, which is a, it's a study of different carbon impacts of, of what people do. Uh, the biggest carbon impact is refrigerants. So he's had an enormous impact. Uh, and it's a good thing we don't all have to dress like him to survive at 21 <laughs> degrees, really. Uh, anyway, the Drawdown is a really interesting book, and it discusses uh, potential uh, things that could happen if we changed various processes, new lifestyles, new education. Um, but I... I would. I really hope there's a, a vernacular, that, that, which is based on local place, local people, and and um, off grid. Well, let's open it up to the floor for questions. Um, we've got a roving microphone at, at the back there. Has anyone got any key questions? Can you turn the lights up? So we can yeah. Can see you turn the, Can we turn the lights up so we can see see you all? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Any questions? Are you optimistic? There you go. Question for you. Who's optimistic out there? Oh, dear. <laughs> oh dear. Well, this brings up a really interesting <laughs> point, enough, which, which, is, yeah. which is the idea of and that the presence of climate anxiety and how one deals with... Um, as I mentioned it um, earlier today, the kind of, um, it's not force met, full horsemen of the apocalypse that seem to be upon us, there seems to be multitudes of, of problems. In terms of how we think and move forward, how we move forward our attitudes, who's got, how do we deal with the multiple crises and the anxieties this might induce, and it is inducing people? Who'd like to, who'd like to talk about that? I'll say one thing. So if you think back to the financial crisis just over 10 years ago, there were lots of things happening simultaneously. You had 
um, the price of oil was going through the roof and people were worrying about um, peak oil, which is a geological inevitability, but exactly when it hits, we don't know, but you know, it's $140 a barrel. There were extreme weather events happening around the world that led to major crop failures. The price of food went up um, all around the world. Tens of millions of people were plunged into sort of um, food poverty um, because of that, and you had the financial crisis as well. And at the time, we tried to kind of imagine a way in which you could have a triple win to respond to that. And the idea was the Green New Deal, investing in the low carbon transition of the economy, creating jobs where it was needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think many of the things that we, we, that we, that we worry about um, now and when we search for solutions, I think those solutions, I think we, we know what some of those solutions are. Configuring the countervailing forces to overturn all the kind of political norms and the ideological norms about how to run the economy is a quite different thing. You talked about the kind of you know, buried assumptions and the stories that we tell. Um, if you peel back the layers of what informs day-to-day -day, um, political economic decision-making and the sort of the market ideology that lies beneath it, if you were to just scratch the surface of the stuff which creates the notion that market's good, public bad, and you looked at what underlies um, theories of um, perfectly competitive markets and general equilibrium theory, they are bizarre. They are, you know, off the scale, nuts. They are bonkers. <laughs> and yet they inform 99% of mainstream economic decision making. And, but because they're, they're sort of buried, they don't get interrogated. You know, it was, apart from anything else, it was over 50 years ago that Bobby Kennedy, who was not exactly kind of a marginal politician at the time, stood up and said that growth measured everything apart from that which makes life worthwhile. And yet for the last half a century plus, we've been beavering away um, because at the folk level of economic decision making, you've got politicians who think that that is the only way you can deliver and stay in post. So apart from anything else, I suppose, I mean, I do feel weirdly, I do feel weirdly optimistic and I can't really explain why I feel weirdly optimistic. I think it's because, um, I think it's because there are, once you look, there are so many good things going on. And I think there's something about an evacuation of self-confidence in the mainstream model at the moment that's leaving something of a vacuum. And in advance, you know, the off-sighted example of the, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and all the rest of it, I don't think you, you can see in advance the moment when you get the flip. And it may be just because I'm pathologically optimistic, but I do feel that there is a confident... Um, understanding of a fundamentally different way of running things, which is kind of building up. And I think the shell of the old system, I think it, I think it, it can crumble. Now, it's not to say that people might not try and drag us down, invested interest might drag us down kind of in the process. But I think we're, I think we're poised for something that could be a lot better. Mm -hmm. Peg, can you talk a little bit about, I suppose, perspectives? One of, one of the things that... Um, makes me incredibly confused is the chaos, perhaps it's just in my head, chaos of um, competing theories, competing possibilities at the moment, that we're going through a phase now where people don't quite understand their agency, the possibility of change. They don't see their individual position as part of a, of a bigger thing. Is it because we are in the, I mean, right, it's a bit hard obviously to know, but um, particularly thinking about history, is it because we're in a period of such rapid shift that we are in a period of chaos and confusion, of competing? Where, and where, if so, where is the possibility of drawing all those radical possibilities that are, that are out there that were there in the past, those, those affirmative imaginaries that you talk about? How can we pull that together in a, in a way that makes meaning to, to us all as individuals? So, I mean, I guess maybe a bit about Ian. I mean, I, I am actually also very positive, um, in a, I mean, maybe crazily, <laughs> but in maybe because I've just programmed myself to kind of argue for the affirmative. And I've certainly had conversations with lots of colleagues over the last 10 years who have insisted on, well, particularly there have been conversations about conflict and the notion of dealing with the negative, and you can only operate through a kind of concept of criticism and criticality. And that ha can only operate truthfully and properly through an embrace of the negative, and that's why I use Mark Fisher, because he's often seen as that one of those figures, which I think is very wrong, especially when he deals with black culture. So I am now reprogrammed thoroughly, because I can't respond to you in the way you'd like me to. But um, 
I mean, I do think there is a very interesting reworking coming through historical research, and that's why I mentioned about Mark Maslin and Simon Lewis. And I don't know Simon Lewis's sort of career history, but Mark Maslin is certainly someone who in UCL is a really important, really you know strong and, and very um, really yeah a really important member of the discussions around climate change and geographers um, contributing to that. But he's certainly someone who I think is quite interesting because he has shifted, I think, from being quite, not hostile, but sceptical about the contribution that the arts or humanities can make to transformation, which is cultural or scientific or political. And I do think this embrace of the notion of a historical kind of methodology that they've taken, which is properly scientific, I mean, it's a beautiful, you know, a beautiful example of that, is really interesting. So... I, but I do think people do that themselves. I mean, this is a little bit why I want to kind of say, um, you know, I do want to keep a kind of scientific practice in view. Um, I know that many people will, you know, that's not necessarily very controversial. But, um, but the other thing I suppose I was just going to say is that this is maybe me speaking about what, where I'm, what I'm doing now. But I mean, I am bizarrely working with colleagues towards doing some work with policymakers in Europe. I mean, it's terrifying, the idea that I'm going to go and have to work with architectural policymakers. My French is appalling and I don't have German, but it's much more in the kind of intellectual sort of experience that I will be with the suits um, if, we, if we get the money. But at the same time, I'm quite excited by that challenge. And I do, actually, your point about this issue of the regulations, you know, it seems to me is, is the the school here working on rewriting building regs. I mean, there is Project W, but I mean, that seems to me to be a very interesting, not, I mean, it's a kind of a game, you know, a world game theory we could play out. Um, so I'm kind of quite interested in the kind of techniques, you know, these quite technical kind of problems that in a way, I think this sort of thing about comfort and actually Bannon makes it into this utopian story. He does take it away from the technology. That's why he's seen as such a beautiful figure of, you know, Bartlett mythology, um, but he is actually coming in, in line with those kinds of um, very, you know, techno-scientific designs of improvement and of energy use. Um, it's like that's where I am at the moment, so I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I'll stop there. Very positive, I like, I like, I like the positive energy. Um, we've got a question right at the back there. I think the microphone winging its way. I'm really interested to hear the word vernacular, which is I haven't heard since for about 30 or 30 years. So that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, um, she was very excited about hearing the word vernacular, oh. which is not heard for about 30 years. <laughs> OK, so um, I heard uh, the word, um, the expression new green nimbies said by a, a, a sort of blogger, urban planning blogger, and that that is an easy way to sort of strike off people who are talking about building buildings differently and maybe not so high, perhaps. So where do we, th that sort of ruling class of, of sort of ways of building seems very, very, you know, difficult to change and turn around in another direction. What, what's going to be the first stage of that? Because it feels very... If you live next to the city and you see these edifices going up all day, you 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 wonder where the opposite and where the vernacular is going to come in. Hmm. Like, I think Ian would like well, to say that. Um, this is where I, I suppose I am. Uh, the big place where I am optimistic is that I think there's a demand growing for change. So um, even in the last few months. Uh, if we just talk about the office market, say, mm -hmm. in London, central London, uh, there are now businesses who are saying that by 2030 they're not going to rent a building unless it's zero carbon. So this is unheard of even last year. You know. So I think, uh, uh, and so in order to make a building that's like that, uh, the construction industry is what got to work out well what can you build a zero net zero carbon building in a city above four stories because you could 
the theoretical model of development, which where you want to have on-site generated power, for example, by PV, means that you could, if you've got enough land and it's about four storeys, you can probably be uh, carbon neutral in use. And if you build it out of timber, that's, that's good. At the moment, the insurance market won't let people build things in timber, uh, certainly above eight storeys. There's lots of technical proof that it's completely safe. But the insurance market's decided after Grenfell, uh, even though a timber structure wasn't implicated in any way, <laughs> and the, the barbecue bonfires up on timber balconies in Hackney mean that now people are really worried about wood. Uh, so there, there are sort of student housing schemes which where developers are saying, well, we've We'd like to use wood, but we can't because students would be afraid of living in a wooden building. No, and some of this is completely understandable reaction. But here, I'm on the side of the science. You know, we've got to make sure is this the right uh, decision. But so I think office buildings in central London will have to change because if if the demand for office buildings from the users is that in 2030 they've got to be zero carbon. They can't be all glass uh, elevations that look the same in every direction and, and get too hot during the day and need refrigerants to cool them down just because they've got too much glass letting the heat in. No, it's just ludicrous design. Um, and that's been just question. As been just, do you question why your clients are demanding this all of a sudden? Which? You, do you, yeah, as an architect? Dem yeah, the, the change in attitude. Well, when I say the, dem the demand is there, but it's not every client. Mm. But I'm hoping that there's going to be a snowball just because more people will start demanding it. Um, and I think generally uh, those who are demanding it, and you, 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 should, you should presume this is a local authority who signed the climate emergency saying they want to be net zero by 2030 should now be briefing that in there. Hmm. But, but the problem is that there are all those other demands about, say, on housing, uh, social housing percentages, uh, capital accounts, to, is the, the money there? I mean, the system, the financial system, which is what you're implying, is broken. The, the way of judging whether a development is, is viable has to change. So like Kate Raworth's Jonas economics. And, you know, there's got to be fundamental change. So I don't know, perhaps there'll even be a revolution in the UK. That would be, that'd be something to just throw it to, because <laughs> we've never had one ever. <laughs> Any more questions out there? Yeah, here on the third row. Hi, uh, I think it's a question directed at Elizabeth, because I'm a little bit confused about your recommendation. Because So you seem to be saying that us as individuals can't do anything, but then how do we start something? How do we do something? Because surely Fangas himself, as an Im individual, started something. And then, in a different way, Greta Thunberg, as an individual, also started something. So how, how do you explain that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the last few minutes of conversation is a good reply to that, in a way. So... You know, you have a kind of issue about zero carbon office buildings and an idea then about vernacular buildings. But for that to work, there has to be also, if you like, vernacular office working or some more systemic shift. I mean, actually there is. So it's interesting how standard office buildings reproduce standard office practices. But, but where does the scope for transforming office life lie? And of course, like these little bits of manoeuvring on the client side may be part of something Bigger, but they may not be as well. I mean, the excitement of building regulations is a, is a kind of, in a way, a bigger prize because that's going to affect lots of buildings without anybody having any strong feelings or anything like the standards we're talking about. Maybe they go in the right, the opposite direction. But so, so exactly as Ian's saying, the, the sort of client choice is there, but then there's the insurance industry, or then there's this, or then there's that. I mean. In some ways, this interdependence might sound like locking in or glue or, you know, you're stuck. But in another way, the interdependence is also generative. So once a system starts to move, 
actually all the parts of it, but you could never put your finger on an individual that says that. I mean, there's some brilliant, some brilliant historical work, you know, like in the making of the electricity system. So, you know, Thomas Hughes wrote this book. Was it Edison? No, it wasn't Edison. Yes, he made the light bulb, but he had to get the wiring in, and then there had to be the appliances, and then, and then, and then, and then. So looking for individual agents or kind of heroes of technology is usually misplaced, but it doesn't mean that the electricity system didn't get built in a certain way. It doesn't mean the sewage system didn't get built. It doesn't mean that the office sector is perhaps on the move. I mean, probably the use of the laptop is more the place to look for your zero carbon clients. I mean, why have an office? You know, so there's other kinds of things going on. So I just think it's very tempting, like what can we do? What, and, and in a way that's, that just stops the kind of thinking that's needed. So that's what I'm saying, better. We have to wrap it up. Yes, we have, we have to wrap it up. We have to wrap it up and head to the bar um, for more conversation. Um, though we're not really wrapping it up, certainly not here at Cent <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, certainly not here at um, Central St. Martins, but also for all of us. I mean, the past 18 months has been, um, since the publication of the IPCC report, has been an amazing roller coaster in transformative change. Um, and here at Central St. Martins, we have to think about how we change our practice, how we change our thinking um, from how we deal with the bins to how we teach to how we work, how we work together. Um, it's been my honor to chair at least most of the fundamentals um, this time round, um, which by virtue necessity rather of the, of the subject matter would probably be more a learning process, a consensual uh, thing, learning about uh, how we possibly can change, how we can possibly think, how we can possibly learn. Um, fundamentals, I hope, will be back in a new shape-shifting goddess-like form um, in the future, and no doubt will return to this subject matter or the relationship with uh, nature and, and the climate. Um, but before we go, I'd like to thank not only our panelists, um, but also those people behind the scenes who have made the whole series work, um, in particular Siobhan Henderson um, and all that have worked but on the series, and of course, Andreas Lang, Mel Dodd, um, Alex Warwick-Smith, um, in spatial practices, who have programmed the whole series, invited all our guests, um, and made it the success that it is. So, um, good evening. Put your hands together and keep positive. <laughs>